Hello, welcome to the LEC seminar. Uh, thank you all for joining. I'm going to stop sharing these wonderful slides about uh, scientists from Black History Month. Let's see, how do I stop share? Perfect. All right, well, it is my privilege today to introduce our seminar speaker. Before I get to that, I want to just remind the graduate students that are involved with LEC fellows that the graduate student grant is due uh, tomorrow. So please remember to submit that. And I think that's all that we have for announcements. As always, remember, uh, or please feel free to put your questions to Christina in the chat box on YouTube, and we will relay those questions to her at the end of her talk. So, uh, yes, today we have the honor of having Christina Matham give us a seminar about ongoing uh, hellbender research here at the St. Louis Zoo. Christina uh, has a Master's of Science from the, of Natural Resources and the Environment from UConn, and she also has her Bachelor's of Science in both Biology and Spanish from the UConn as well. Uh, before her position at uh, the Wild Care Institute here at St. Louis Zoo, uh, she was, and I love this, she was assistant fur bearer, like fur bearer, F-U-R-B-E-A-R-E-R. -E -E um, she was assistant fur bearer biologist at uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation. And before that, she's actually worked with several fish and wildlife services across several states, including New York and Wyoming. And she Although she's been doing all this conservation work and all this hands-on uh, research, she also is very well published. She has many publications in top herpetological journals, as well as many uh, journals of uh, zoology and also urban and environmental science. Uh, one fun fact that Christina told me about, which is really cool, and I, I think this is the first time this has happened for an LEC seminar, she is currently going to give her seminar in her tiny house on wheels in uh, North St. Louis. I'm pretty sure this is the first time we're having a seminar speaker give a talk on wheels in a house. So pretty awesome. And without further ado, thank you so much, Christina. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Brett, for that great introduction. Um, and thank you all uh, for coming to listen to this talk. Um, so like you said, my name's Christina. Um, I'm currently a research fellow for the Ron and Karen Gellner Center for Hellbender Conservation at the St. Louis Zoo. And today I'm gonna be telling you guys a little bit about some ongoing hellbender research at the zoo. So just a little bit of background. Um, prior to working at the zoo, I worked as a technician for, as a wildlife technician and wildlife ecologist for a number of different state and federal agencies across the country. 
Um, my research um, has a is primarily focused on amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, um, and with a special interest in species of greatest conservation need. Um, I started working at the St. Louis Zoo in January of 2020. And essentially, this job is a collaborative position between the St. Louis Zoo, the Missouri Department of Conservation, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. And um, essentially, my responsibilities are to complete um, projects that uh, the zoo and its partners have deemed as priority projects for the species recovery plan, as well as to identify future area or areas for future research inquiry. So today I'm going to be talking about four of the main projects that I've worked on up to this point. Um, the first is the creation of a literature database. Um, the second is a project that looks at the history of hellbenders of the Ozark Plateau and conservation efforts for those hellbenders. Um, next, I'll be talking a little bit about um, the zoo's conservation breeding and head starting program. And lastly, I'll get into um, an ongoing water quality project. So the first project that I started working on at the zoo is the create was the creation of a customizable and searchable literature database. Um, and I'll get into exactly what that means um, here in the next few slides. But for those of you who aren't familiar with literature databases, sometimes they're referred to as citation generators, um, but there's a lot of benefits to using literature databases. So the first is that they serve as an excellent repository and archive for um, important documents. So in our case, that means um, different agency reports, um, scientific research articles, as well as education and outreach materials. Um, so it's a great place for us to store all of that information in one location and to easily access that information. The next benefit, which is um, likely the one that you are all most familiar with, is uh, their use as a, a citation generator. So as you're writing a report or a research article, it allows you to quickly search the database for a relevant citation. So you're able to cite as you write. Um, this is much easier and more efficient than you having a folder where your academic articles um, live and you have to manually sort through all of that and uh, type out that citation. Um, in addition, it also will automatically create a bibliography or a reference list for all of the citations you include as you're writing. So this reduces a lot of error, um, and it's also really helpful when it comes to reformatting. Um, so if you think you're submitting to one journal and they have specific formatting requirements and then you switch and decide to submit to a different one, you can do that with a couple of clicks rather than um, a very tedious, uh, time-consuming manual process of, uh, of changing um, all of your citations and your, your reference lists. Um, the next major benefit is that um, it operates as its own kind of mini search engine. So you have this wonderful repository of all of the documents that you need, and within the database you're able to search by author, by title, um, by publication year or, or journal, um, and in the case of ours, um, we have created customizable search tags for each of our articles, um, and I'll get into that a little bit more in the next couple of slides, but we're also able to search directly for those um, search terms. Um, another benefit is that there is some minor editing capabilities, so you can highlight documents, you can write notes or comments, and this is great for live documents or working documents. If you're um, uh, working with partners or other collaborators, it's a, an easy way for you guys to exchange information um, about a specific document. And then lastly, because all of this information is centralized and located um, all in one, one place, um, it makes the information much more accessible to the zoo and its partners. Um, it also makes uh, sharing this information much more efficient with researchers outside of our immediate partners and collaborators. So we've had other Hellbender researchers contact us um, asking for additional information, um, looking at how for example, endocrine disruptors um, or hormones in, in um, hellbender rivers might be impacting hellbender populations. And with a few key search terms, we're able to generate automatically generate a list of citations to pass along to that researcher and focus their efforts. 
So for those of you who aren't familiar, this is what the Mendeley desktop looks like. Um, you can see at the top left um, where you can add a file or a folder. There's also a fantastic sync option. So if you do have a folder where you um, keep all of your literature database PDFs uh, or all of your scientific article uh, PDFs, um, you can dump them into that folder. And if it's synced with the desktop, the next time you open the desktop, all of those articles will automatically populate in the center panel and you can review them at your leisure. Um, so again, removing kind of extra manual steps, saving you time um, and increasing efficiency. You can also see below that, that you can organize your data in a lot of different ways. So you can tag or categorize the data using um, the recently added or the recently read or favorites or needs review markers. Um, you can also create folders to organize your information. Um, next, we'll talk about kind of the search searching capabilities. So one, you can filter by authors, as you can see in the bottom right or bottom left, excuse me. Um, and then there's that search bar at the top, which allows you to search through, um, like I said, by author title um, or our key search terms, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, in the center panel, you can see here all of the articles and documents that are in our database. Um, this is an old screenshot, but we currently have more than a thousand documents uh, pertaining to hellbenders and water quality and hellbender occupied rivers in our database. Um, and so if you were to click once on any of these articles, it will generate this uh, rightmost panel, which is essentially a quick look at that article. Um, so you can see the type of document that it is, titles, authors, um, and additional information if it's there. And you can see the notes and contents tabs as well. So for example, we'll look more closely at this first uh, document. Um, if you were to double click, it, that center panel now fills with a PDF of that document, and you can use it as a PDF reader. Um, you can open multiple PDFs at the same time, as you can see. So if you're working, you can easily switch between the two of them. Um, and then the really key feature for us is this tag section. So if you scroll down on that quick looks panel, you can see this tag section. So this is a condensed version to show you some of the things that were important for us to highlight. And these include, but are not limited to, um, are the subspecies, the currently recognized subspecies designations. So you can see the scientific name and the colloquial name for Eastern hellbenders. Um, Another important thing for us was to have regional marketer, uh, demarcators. So we have state tags and we have specific river tags as well. So if we were to go back to the previous, um, uh, previous panel um, and we were to search using one of these key terms, that center panel would immediately filter out all of the documents that contain Georgia, for example, um, which is a really, really fantastic tool um, for you to locate specific um, uh, specific research interests um, and to quickly pull out information that might be relevant. So, and these tags are completely customizable. So we have tags covering everything from reproduction to behavior to, um, different husbandry protocols. Um, and so it's a really, really fantastic tool for the zoo and its partners and beyond. Um, it has also proven to be an extremely useful tool for me for the second project that I worked on, that I've been working on, which is a history of hellbenders of the Ozark Plateau project. And so the objective of this project is to document a history of hellbenders in Missouri and Arkansas as well as the contributions of the zoo and its partners to hellbender conservation efforts. So uh, the modern day hellbenders that we know today diverged from their Asiatic giant salamander um, relatives approximately 70 million years ago. And since then they dispersed to occupy the lands of several indigenous peoples in what is now the Eastern United States. Um, there is evidence to suggest that hellbenders were culturally relevant to many of these indigenous peoples. Um, in particular, um, hellbenders were shown to be a crucial component to Cherokee mythology. And there's also um, a lot of evidence to suggest that, though infrequently, hellbenders were often consumed as a food source. Um, and I think this really highlights for me just how um, hellbenders have been culturally important since the very beginning. Um, and that's why it really is so, so important for us to be working to conserve this native species. Following colonization, we see 
drastic changes in land use, aquatic ecosystems, and freshwater biodiversity um, across the contiguous United States, um, but also, and in, in particular, uh, for the context of this talk, in the Ozark Plateau region. So in this region, we see um, conversion of native forest and grass and prairie lands to um, primarily agriculture originally. And then subsequently, we've seen increases in um, industrial, commercial, and residential developments in the area. And these um, are projected, these trends are projected to continue into the future. In addition to these kind of terrestrial changes to the land, we see, we also saw um, a lot of changes to aquatic ecosystems. So um, European settlers tend to, tended to see wetlands as unproductive lands. And as a result, many wetlands were um, completely destroyed or converted to other uses. Um, and in Arkansas, um, they saw a loss of over 70% of native water bodies. And in Missouri, um, over 85% of native water bodies have been lost. In addition to that, um, many of the remaining water bodies have been drastically changed or are impaired in some capacity. So for example, impoundment. Um, impoundment often leads to significant changes in hydrology. Um, it leads to changes in temperature, dissolved oxygen, um, and uh, many other features of the aquatic ecosystem. Um, we're also concerned about uh, pollution inputs um, and other uh, inputs into, into our water bodies as the terrestrial land around them also continues to change. Um, and last, lastly, we see major changes in freshwater biodiversity as um, non-native and native fish have been stocked um, increasingly in um, our water bodies since the early 1800s. You can also see um, in the literature the kind of colonial discovery of hellbenders um, with the first scientific publications um, remarking of hellbenders um, and you can see um, these publications uh, kind of travel westward with westward expansion. So many of these first pu uh, publications focused on hellbender populations from Pennsylvania and New York. And as uh, the human population moved westward, we see increasing populations um, uh, further west in the species range, ultimately ending in the state of Missouri um, and the description of the Ozark hellbender subspecies in that state. Um, um, but we see here that very early on, there is an, a, a clear interest in hellbenders and hellbender research, and um, that only has continued since that time, which has proven to be actually very, uh, very useful uh, for a species that is currently listed as federally endangered, um, because we do actually have some baseline data um, to look at and identify uh, population declines. Um, so the earliest documentation of hellbender declines um, came from publications in the 1970s and 80s. Um, however, these publications um, suggested that there were specific populations in decline or perhaps specific states that were experiencing declines, um, but it wasn't necessarily range wide. Um, in particular, in the Ozark Plateau, um, it seemed like populations were still strong and healthy. Um, there was evidence of active reproduction and um, a wide range of age classes within these populations. However, by the 1990s, it became clear that um, populations in the Ozark Plateau were also um, in, in steep decline. Um, this led to the identification of potential threats or drivers of their decline. Um, so it's still not entirely clear exactly what led to hellbender population declines, um, but it is likely many of these potential threats or a combination of them. Um, and these include changes to water quality, alterations to the riverine habitat, like I mentioned with impoundment, um, exploitation is also a major concern with several hundred hellbenders um, being known to have been removed from the state of Missouri, um, both legally and illegally for the pet trade and for scientific and educational purposes. Um, predation by native and non-native fishes is also a concern, as is disease with um, wild hellbender populations having confirmed cases of chytrid 
Um, and lastly, we also observe um, just general declines in health. So in many of the remaining hellbender populations, um, these hellbenders are um, have exhibit a lot of abnormalities. So they have gross lesions, uh, wounds that won't heal, um, and they're often missing appendages. So this indicates that they have a low body condition and are generally not very healthy. Um, so here is where um, the zoo and its partners come into play. So even before the declines um, in hellbenders in the Ozark Plateau, um, the zoo had a public or has it continues to have um, a public facing exhibit um, with Ozark help uh, with Ozark Plateau herps at the Charles Hustle Herpetarium. But following the documented declines, um, Ron Gellner, who was a curator for reptiles and a general curator at the zoo, um, really took this on as a passion project. Um, he really got involved in a uh, partnership with uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation and created uh, an off-exhibit artificial stream in the basement of the Charles Hustle Herpetarium with the goal of hopefully having breeding hellbenders in that stream one day. <laughs> Um, shortly after that, the Ozark Hellbender Working Group was um, uh, finalized or formed, excuse me, um, and this solidified the partnership between the St. Louis Zoo, um, the Missouri Department of Conservation, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and their goal was ultimately to um, work on uh, how, how best to conserve and manage the species. <laughs> Um, shortly after that, the first juvenile hellbenders were brought to the zoo for rearing. Um, in 2003, the hellbender was officially listed as endangered in the state of Missouri. Um, and in 2004, um, Dr. Jeffrey Bonner, the former Dana Brown president and CEO of the zoo, founded the Wild Care Institute. Um, and that the Wild Care Institute at the time was led by Dr. Eric Miller, Miller, who was the executive director of the Wild Care Institute and vice president of the zoo. And the goal of the Wild Care Institute is to create a sustainable future for wildlife and for people around the world through research, natural resource management and habitat protection, um, community development and building local capacity through training. So they really take a very holistic approach to wildlife conservation and that's exactly what was needed for um, the hellbender. Um, so shortly after that, the first breeding adults were actually placed in the indoor stream that Ron Gellner created. Um, unfortunately, he passed away in 2006, and the center was renamed the Ron Gellner Center for Hellbender Conservation in his memory. Um, at this time, um, there is a lot of momentum behind um, hellbender conservation. Um, and so with the help of funding from the Missouri Department of Conservation, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and many very generous donors, um, the zoo was able to dedicate additional off-exhibit space to hellbender conservation efforts. And this came in the form of an additional two artificial streams for breeding groups and um, several rooms that are dedicated to rearing um, the hellbenders um, behind the scenes. Um, in terms of the conservation breeding program, um, infertile eggs were laid in 2007, 2008, 2009, and 2010. And then following some changes to the water quality setup, um, the zoo became the first to ever successfully breed Ozark hellbenders in 2011, in the same exact month that the Ozark hellbender was listed as federally endangered. Um, throughout all of that time, the zoo was already head starting both Ozark and Eastern Hellbenders, and those the first individuals to be released back into the wild for them was in uh, 2008 and 2012, respectively. The zoo reached another major milestone in 2018 when Hellbenders that were originally bred at the zoo were uh, successfully reproduced for the first time. Um, and this is huge because prior to that, there was no way for the zoo and its partners to confirm that um, any of the hellbenders that they had been releasing were reproductively viable or that they um, you know, had any chance of actually contributing to recruitment in the wild population. Um, and so this was evidence uh, to the zoo and its partners that all the animals that they had been releasing at least have the potential to be um, contributing to reproduction events in the wild. 
Um, and then in 2021, the Eastern Hellbender population in Missouri was also federally listed as endangered. So as some of you might know, hellbenders are a, a rather cryptic species. So they live in uh, river systems and are often found under large cover objects, making them very hard to observe, um, especially to observe for long amounts of time, and in particular to observe without disturbing their habitat, which we obviously don't want to do. So um, the having the conservation breeding and head starting program at the zoo has really contributed greatly to um, scientific research. Um, so the zoo and its partners have been able to contribute to research and looking at um, hellbender reproductive behavior, embryo and larval development, um, the creation of husbandry protocols, as well as uh, protocols for rearing, releasing, and veterinary care of hellbenders. Um, they've also looked into the diet and nutrition of wild and um, hellbenders, of, of wild hellbenders, as well as hellbenders at the zoo. And then hellbenders that were reared at the zoo and released into the wild contributed to research um, on habitat use and movement. Um, they've also contributed to hematological studies and disease work, in particular with chytrid. Um, they've also looked at predator prey dynamics um, and have created best management uh, practices for surveying hellbenders. Um, they've also contributed samples to genetic analyses and overall uh, they've contributed to ongoing monitoring efforts of hellbender populations. And to date, the zoo has released um, 8,599 Ozark hellbenders and 877 Eastern hellbenders. Um, it has been uh, particularly poignant to be working on this project at this particular time as uh, Karen Gellner, Ron Gellner's uh, wife, passed away at the end of 2021. Um, the center has been renamed to the Ron and Karen Gellner Center for Hellbender Conservation as a result um, due to their um, passion for and um, support for hellbender conservation. Um, as I already mentioned, the Eastern Hellbender population of Missouri was also listed as endangered in 2021, and the Ozark Hellbender continues to be uh, federally listed as endangered. So I think it's really important uh, for us to kind of see where we've come from, um, kind of acknowledge the progress that we've made, um, but also uh, it really serves to kind of reinvigorate um, the passion that we need to have to uh, conserve this, this species. Um, and ultimately, the goal is to create self-sustaining wild populations of hellbenders in, uh, in the state of Missouri. Um, and the continued conservation breeding and head starting efforts of the zoo is one primary way um, that has been identified uh, in the species uh, recovery plan to accomplish this. Um, and the other is through the identification and management of some of these potential drivers of decline. Um, and so I'm going to talk about these two things for the rest of the talk now. So another project that I've been working on is uh, looking through the conservation breeding and head starting data at the zoo. Um, and so the objective is to examine the reproduction, growth, development, and survival of zoo reared hellbenders. So we had two main goals with this project. The first is simply to investigate the factors that influence egg production, egg development, and mortality of zoo bred Ozark hellbenders. Um, and this is important because um, it serves as, it can serve as really uh, crucial baseline data for the zoo, especially now that we have second generation breeding groups, um, that baseline data is going to be really crucial for the zoo moving forward um, to assess their progress. Um, our second goal is to identify differences in larval growth and long-term growth of zoo-reared Ozark and Eastern hellbenders, um, primarily based on their river of origin. Um, and this is important because there is there are several genetic analyses that suggest that even within the subspecies, um, populations of hellbenders are very genetically distinct. Um, and so if we identify differences in these responses, um, uh, we can identify um, <clears throat> that suggests that there are biological differences between these river populations because um, while some of these factors can be influenced by um, environmental factors, um, 
here at the zoo, um, non-breeding hellbenders experience the same standardized and unbiased care. So if we're still observing these differences, um, it, it's an indication to us that these are due to biological differences between the river systems and not just um, an artifact of environmental differences in the river systems themselves. So this is still an ongoing project. So I'm gonna give you uh, overall preliminary results and then I'm gonna focus on one specific result from each of our two goals. So with regard to our first goal, we did successfully identify factors influencing egg production, egg development and mortality of zoo bred Ozark hellbenders. Um, and the result I'm gonna focus in on is egg development here and specifically embryo development time. So this is the time for an, a given egg clutch, um, the time from oviposition, so when the eggs are laid, to a, a, a weighted hatch date for the clutch. So that is the total time that a, a clutch of eggs is developing. Um, and as we can see, um, we found that breeding group generation was a significant predictor of this response. Um, and we found that hellbenders from the first generation breeding group tended to have longer embryo development times than hellbenders from the second generation breeding group. And this actually makes a lot of sense to us. Um, so the breeding group adults from the second generation are very young. Um, as I mentioned, the first successful reproductive event was in 2018. So these are some of their first ever reproductive events. And they are, they are also smaller on average than the breeding group adults from the first generation. And this is consistent, what we're finding here, this, this result is consistent with um, what we know about amphibian reproduction in general. So typically larger adults um, in, uh, will tend to produce more eggs. They will produce eggs with more resources, which results in longer uh, embryonic development time and hatching at a larger size and or uh, further along developmental stage. Um, and this actually has many cascading benefits. So as you can imagine, um, there are several benefits to hatching at a larger size. Um, one is you are less vulnerable to predation, right? So there are fewer animals that you can fit into their mouths. Um, and the second is that you are more successful at foraging because you can fit more into your mouth. Um, and the third is, um, often has a lot to do with uh, mobility. So particularly in riparian environments, um, when if you were to have a flood or um, a much uh, larger volume of water going through a river system uh, for some reason, uh, following immediately following hatchling, it's, um, it can be devastating to, to that life stage and often leads to very high mortality rates as um, they just get swept downstream. Um, so if you're larger, you can imagine that it might be a little bit easier to hold on to the substrate of the river um, in these high volume flows. Um, and so not only are these there are these immediate benefits post hatching, but we actually, um, if you look at the, the amphibian re, uh, data or research, excuse me, um, you see that um, the discrepancy in size at the time of hatching often is uh, compounded. And so these benefits uh, lead to further and further um, differences in size through time. So ultimately, this is not a surprising finding, but it is really, really useful baseline data for the zoo, right? So the goal would be to see that mean for the second generation um, with time, move closer and closer and closer to the mean from that first generation breeding group. Um, and so this is a great way for the zoo to track the specific parameter and uh, track the progress of their, their new, or their, the second generation breeding group and any subsequent uh, breeding groups. With regard to our second goal, we did find evidence of biological differences in larval and long-term growth for zoo reared hellbenders. Um, I'm focusing here on Ozark hellbenders um, because the relationship was much stronger um, uh, in part because we just have a lot more data for Ozark hellbenders. Um, and what we found is in accordance with observations uh, from the wild of body size between these populations, but also in accordance with the genetic relationship of these, these disparate populations. So you can see here, there is one population of, of individuals that has a consistently higher average total body length um, relative to the other two. 
Um, and we see in observations from the wild that uh, individuals from the wild also um, in that river system also tend to have larger body sizes than the other two river systems. And that river system is genetically more distinct from the other two, which are actually quite closely related. So um, this is another great finding um, and corroborates existing evidence. Um, uh, yeah, so you'll have to wait to hear more about the rest of this project, um, but uh, it's really promising so far. So um, the next major project that I've been working on is a water quality project. So like we mentioned or like I mentioned earlier, um, one of the you know primary suspected drivers of hellbender decline is degradation of water quality in hellbender occupied rivers. Um, and so the objective of this project is to compile um, uh, data from uh, water chemistry data sets, riparian habitat data sets, hydrology data sets, and biodiversity data sets um, with the hope of being able to assess what different water quality parameters um, and create a, a deeper kind of temporal look at these specific parameters. Um, with the hopes of identifying uh, some potentially important parameters uh, that might be um, influencing hellbender populations. So these goals, goals specifically um, are more catered to the water chemistry subset of water quality aspects that we're looking at, um, but you can imagine how a similar framework would apply for the other subsets as well. Um, and some additional background. Um, so the EPA establishes criteria for different water bodies um, for specific pollutants and parameters based on the water use of that water body, right? So um, standards for a drinking water supply is going to be very different than standards for recreational use, or in our case, what we're interested in is aquatic life. Um, additionally, it's important to note that um, while the EPA has created criteria for aquatic life, these are often based um, on based in research primarily done in fish and macroinvertebrates. So even if we do see an exceedance in a particular um, for a criteria for a particular parameter, um, we don't necessarily know um, what that means for hellbenders um, or um, what life stage that might be most important for um, in the context of hellbender uh, population declines. So with all that in mind, <laughs> um, one of our goals is to obviously is to identify rivers that have parameters exceeding the EPA's aquatic life criteria, as this would be an indication to us, even though it's not a perfect framework, but it would be an indication to us um, that that's a parameter um, deserving of some additional scrutiny. In addition to that, we want to compare um, parameter values across uh, across rivers, um, and this is still useful for parameters where there is an established criteria. Um, but in particular, it's this will be important for parameters where there is no currently established criteria. Um, if we were to find, you know, a, a river with a very high magnitude for a specific parameter relative to all of the other rivers, that's an indication to us for some targeted um, research and monitoring efforts or management efforts in that particular river. Um, next, we'd want to identify um, parameter patterns that mirror population patterns. So if we identify a par parameter that as the parameter increases, uh, hellbender population decreases, that's an indication to us that that's uh, potentially a parameter influencing population declines and that we should look into it further. Um, and ultimately, again, the, the overarching goal here is to compile all of this information such that we can um, target future research, monitoring, and management priorities in hellbender occupied rivers. So next I'm going to run through um, one example of a data set that I've gone through. Um, in this particular case, uh, we didn't necessarily learn new information, so I can give you kind of what the full circle would look like. Um, but uh, I think it's, yeah, it's a good, uh, a good example of kind of the approach we're taking. So the EPA, creates um, 303D listed water bodies, which are basically water bodies that have been deemed impaired for one reason or another. Um, and I compiled um, 
all of the information I could find about 303 delisted water bodies and hellbender of, of hellbender occupied rivers. Um, and found that a majority of hellbender rivers um, in the Ozark Plateau have been listed in some capacity, um, and the first to be listed occurred in 1996. Um, in the case of hellbender occupied rivers, we find that uh, causes of impairment have included siltation, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, chloride, sulfates, temperature, heavy metals, fecal coliform, and bacteria. Um, when we looked at this data more closely, um, we identified that um, heavy metals in particular seem to be um, a, a frequent cause of impairment for hellbender occupied rivers, um, uh, both currently and historically. Um, in addition to that, it seems to be a consistent problem. So if a, uh, if a river is listed as impaired due to a heavy metal, they tend to continue to be impaired because of heavy metal um, exceedances for several years. Whereas another river perhaps is listed for fecal coliform and in a couple of years um, that's been remediated and managed appropriately. Um, and so the river is removed from the list. Um, and so this, this approach highlighted just not just current, but also past causes of impairments and patterns and impairments. Um, this, however, was not new information. Um, uh, it's it's uh, it's been known to researchers in the hellbender sphere that heavy metals are a concern in hellbender occupied rivers, and as such, there have been research efforts specifically looking at heavy metals in water samples, but also um, in the context of bioaccumulation um, within hellbenders. So uh, blood samples were collected at one point from hellbenders and um, it doesn't seem that bioaccumulation is a, as a particular concern for hellbenders specifically. So that's kind of, um, though it didn't happen in order, um, that's kind of what we would want to happen in this project. Um, we identify important parameters and that leads to active research um, and kind of elimination or identification of actual threats to, to the hellbenders. Um, so yeah, so looking forward, um, this position ends in December. So my goals are to continue to update the literature database. That's an ongoing project. Um, I'd like to finalize and publish our history of the hellbender project, as well as our conservation breeding and head starting project. And lastly, I'd like to complete processing the water quality data we've been going through and write up a report for the zoo and its partners with the hopes that we can use this information to apply for grant funding um, to monitor water quality in Hellbender rivers um, based on the parameters we've identified as being of interest. Um, with that, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. Um, and if you want to learn more about what's going on at the zoo, you can check out the St. Louis Zoo, uh, St. Louis Zoo blog. Um, and if you want to learn more about Hellbender specifically, um, the St. Louis Zoo did host um, virtual happy hour events back in 2020, and there is a Hellbender specific event. So if you want to check that out, um, I recommend looking into that. And with that, I will take any questions that folks might have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Christina. That was uh, absolutely fantastic. It's really good to always learn about what the, the zoo's up to. And we, I mean, of course, we know there's a lot of work going on over at the zoo for uh, conserving biodiversity, but it's good to see the actual details. So this is just a reminder to the audience, please leave any questions that you have for Christina in the uh, chat box there on YouTube. And as we wait, I have a couple of questions. Um, so I guess the first big question I have, and I don't want people to paint me in a negative light from this question, which is probably a question you, you wouldn't imagine a conservation scientist asking you, but why do we care about the conservation of hellbenders? Um, I mean, obviously hellbenders are super cool and I can come up with a lot of reasons, but I'd, I'd like to hear like, you know, why does the zoo think that so much of the resources should be applied to conservation of hellbenders. Yeah, I mean, so I think there's a lot of different angles and a lot of different arguments to be made. Um, from like a purely scientific standpoint, they are a really interesting like evolutionary branch in amphibians. They're a very ancestral branch of salamanders. Um, 
So I think they're really fascinating uh, personally for that reason. <laughs> um, but I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think there, there really is a, a cultural component here, right? These are species that are native to the, the United States. Um, they've been culturally important to, um, to folks since, since they've been here. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, what we've seen here with the zoo really, really re-emphasizes like how much people care about them. Um, it is, uh, it is consistently a center that is um, very like ranks very high amongst uh, zoo vid visitors. Um, we get a lot of donors very interested in our conservation work, um, and it's also you know we are um, we're we're successful. Um, we are actively releasing individuals back into the wild, um, and we have been for several years. Um, so I think it's um, I, I think uh, the interest is there. Um, and also, you know, from an ecological perspective, uh, you know, every every animal, um, big or small, has a role in a food web, um, and we're all interconnected at the end of the day. And so, every time you lose a piece of that, um, your system is less resilient, and um, it is it's uh, not functioning at its optimal capacity. Um, so, I think there's there's a lot of reasons to support hellbenders. Um, but uh, it also just it just seems to be a species that people really care about, which is uh, amazing because it's not um, what a lot of people would consider to be a traditionally cute animal. It's not furry, <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, it's really struck a chord with people. And I think that's that's amazing. So. Thank you. The, I mean, thank you for this wonderful talk. I. I'm a big fan. I hope that you can take me out maybe to see some <laughs> hellbenders someday. Um, Dr. Sharon Deem has a question. She says, thank you, Christina. Wonderful work. I may have missed it, but can you speak to if and how EDCs are impacting hellbender con conservation? And just for me, my own edification, what are EDCs? <laughs> I imagine endocrine disruptors. Okay. Um, yeah, um, so that's definitely an area that we can look into more. Um, it doesn't seem like there is a, a direct impact um, at this point. Um, obviously, more information could come out. Um, I know very early on um, in the context of, of the declines, uh, a lot of people were very worried about that. Um, and it seems to be at least looking at kind of like what the zoo has experienced in terms of like breeding. Um, I think it's it's largely due to other water quality parameters being um, potentially out of kilter. So uh, with the zoo specifically, it was a conductivity problem. So they had um, several years where eggs were laid, but they were never fertile. Um, and then they adjusted the conductivity of their water to more closely match the, the native rivers. And that was what ultimately led to successful reproduction. Um, so it's possible that um, it's possible that they are having an impact, um, but there hasn't necessarily been a direct link thus far, as far as I know. Excellent. All right. A lot of questions are coming in now. Uh, so here's our next one from Earth Sky C. They say, great presentation, Christina. I'm wondering if and how you attempt to avoid unintended natural selection during captive breeding. Yeah, so I mean, the zoo is very careful to um, maintain genetic diversity and to, uh, you know, make sure that we're not, um, yeah, that we're maintaining genetic diversity as much as possible. I think something that is was really good for that that wasn't necessarily standard at the time, um, but it definitely is now, is that um, the zoo was so careful about maintaining hellbenders from their respective rivers of origin and only breeding those adults from those original populations. Um, and like, that is not, like I said, that was not necessarily inherently standard at the time, um, but now, especially with all of the genetic works that have, that's come out with hellbenders, um, that's like so amazing that they had the forethought to do that um, and that we're able to maintain these very unique genetic lineages that way. Um, so I'm, 
I mean, it might happen, um, but the zoo definitely takes every precaution that they can um, to avoid that. Um, and also um, a lot of the animals are, are, are collected from clutches laid in the wild. So we don't know the parents of those clutches, um, but they're just reared at the zoo and released. Um, it is possible that you know, there is some genetic bottlenecking um, just because it is a rare species. I think that's really primary, primarily where you're going to see the, those effects is, is just that the, there's so few individuals, period, um, let alone um, whatever the zoo is doing. But they do their best to not, in, not contribute to that inbreeding. So, Great. Our next question is from Liana Van Zen, who asks, is the zoo doing anything specific um, research on chytrid or any specific research on chytrid. I remember watching a talk on them before and chytrid was really emphasized as one of the main causes of population destruction. Yeah, so um, chytrid is still considered a potential threat. Um, there, so uh, all of the chytrid stuff started in about 2006 um, when it was discovered that hellbenders that were brought into the zoo were chytrid positive which led to them testing um, populations in the wild for chytrid. And they did discover that there were positive animals, uh, chytrid positive animals in the wild. Um, uh, it also led to looking back at some historical specimens um, that suggest that chytrid has been there for several more decades than we ever anticipated. Um, but ultimately um, there, were, there was research that collected like swab samples of um, in particular, these animals that are exhibiting these abnormalities, these open wounds, um, missing appendages, which like could could be related to or indicative of, of chytrid perhaps. Um, and it seems that they were primarily colonized just by opportunistic bacteria. So it didn't really, it wasn't a strong indication that chytrid specifically was causing those problems. Um, so again, it is possible that it is leading to mortality events, but it's likely not, an individual driver um, and it likely necess is there needs to be other things in place to get to a point of leading to mortality, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Uh, all right, another question. Are you ready for another one? Sure. All right. Uh, so this is coming from John Birmingham Jr. Uh, he's asking, are you able to identify individuals for recapture either with tags or genetically? And I actually meant to, before I end here, I meant to say that uh, Sharon Neem, they say that you were correct. She was referring to endocrine disruptor chemicals. So cool. you answer. <laughs> cool. The question from uh, John Birmingham is, are you able to identify individuals for recapture either with tags or genetically? Um, yes, uh, I'm not, I'm less sure about genetic information, um, but I do know that um, all of the, all of the hellbenders that get released from the zoo have um, little they're microchips basically they're they're called pit tags um but basically it's the same same kind of thing that your dog or cat gets when they go to the vet you can swipe over it with a a, a, a reader and it will give out a unique code um, obviously these are much smaller than the microchips your dogs or cats get um, but all the hellbenders that have been released from the zoo um, leave with one of these microchips so if they're ever recaptured they're scanned and we know exactly what individual it is, what cohort they came from, what clutch they came from, et cetera. So yes, that is, that's a critical kind of piece of evidence for the ongoing monitoring efforts for, for the species. So our next question comes from Susie Ingle who asks, can you tell me which rivers the zoo generated hellbenders were released to? I don't know if you're allowed to release that information. And are the newer hellbenders holding their own in that population or will you look at that? Yeah, so not gonna specify rivers, <laughs> um, but um, uh, yes, that information is actively being monitored at the moment. Um, there hasn't been any official publications about that information yet, but that is um, another central component to the ongoing monitoring efforts. So um, at some point there will be a publication about how successful or not successful um, the individuals that have been released are, um, but it's, uh, these are a very long lived species. So um, they grow very slowly. Um, they don't reach sexual maturity until they're approximately five or six years old. So um, it takes, it just takes a while to get this data. Um, 
And also we want to minimize our impacts to their habitat as much as off, uh, as much as possible, right? If we're flipping over their rocks every single year, that's very destructive to their habitat. So um, we're on a, a different, we're not, we're not sampling every single year to get this information, um, which is part of the reason why it's, uh, see, it feels delayed, I guess. <laughs> So quick follow up and I, again I understand why we want to be very sensitive about saying you know which rivers or where exactly these uh, endangered species that I <laughs> go and play with are or are located but I am wondering if you could give any information of like how many different rivers or the size of the area where you're releasing these are we talking about because you guys have released almost 10,000 individuals right so is this almost statewide or is this like and one and again you don't need to say what region but is this in like a small maybe one one river system or yeah can you just give us the basic spatial impact that you guys are having with your ten thousand uh releases yeah so there are several rivers that contain hellbenders um in missouri and arkansas um and they're all located in the ozark plateau region um but uh in general um the Missouri Department of Conservation and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, they know um, along these rivers where there is a suitable hellbender habitat, right? So not the entire length of these rivers is not necessarily suitable for hellbenders. Um, they have very specific habitat requirements. And so um, they know where these specific habitat locations are, and that is typically where they target releasing these animals. So it's throughout the, the stretch of these rivers, um, but targeted to areas where their habitat is present, if that makes sense, so. Yeah, it does. And just follow up. So again, you mentioned that uh, the zoo has been responsible for almost 10,000 individuals being released. Is that like pretty much 100% of the individuals that have been released into the wild or are there other rearing programs through Missouri uh, conservation or U.S. fishing game, or I mean, yeah. So, what percentage is the of the ten? Yeah, of ten of the ten thousand years released. What percentage is that of the total releases in Missouri? Um. So the only other um, rearing that I'm aware of, there was some rearing um, at one of the hatcheries, one of the Missouri Department of Conservation hatcheries. I don't know if they're continue if that's that's an ongoing thing or not. Um, but uh, I know also that some of those ended up being transferred to the zoo at some point also. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that that number is um, probably not a hundred percent, but very close to a hundred percent. Obviously, there are other states that have head starting programs um, uh, and other states that have partnerships with zoos to 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 do similar um, similar work in their own respective states. But um, yeah, I think it is very close to a hundred percent for Missouri, um, to the best of my knowledge. So. <laughs> Okay, so John Birmingham Jr. has some more questions for you. First, are hellbenders able to regenerate limbs as tiger salamanders can? Um, yeah, so they do have some healing, uh, like self-healing properties. Um, I I don't think they necessarily, like any time a salamander regener regenerates a limb, it's not the same as the original limb. Um, like it's sometimes they lack bone structure and it's more just cartilaginous material. So um, in that capacity, yes. Um, but one, one of the things that we're seeing with these abnormalities is that is inhibited. So they continue, the, these, these wounds and these missing appendages persist rather than um, kind of having any sort of regenerative. Um, so yes, they do, it's limited. Um, so they're not going to perfectly regrow a foot or a leg, um, but they might. It might rejuvenate a little bit. <laughs> okay, and then he has another question: Are you banking tissue samples that could be correlated with the microchips? Um, not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, I don't. I yeah. I don't know. 
Okay, and then he has a, another question. Does the presence or absence of hellbenders have an impact on river ecology? And can that effect be differentiated from con confounding effects such as pollution? Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, does the presence or absence of hellbenders have an impact on the ecology of the river? So are the hellbenders shaping that river? Mm -hmm. And can this effect be differentiated from the confounding effects of pollution where because the river system is polluted, there's no hellbenders? Oh, I see. Um, yeah, so they absolutely have an ecological effect. So um, like a lot of amphibians, they serve as both predator and prey. Um, so especially the smaller life stages, they're a huge prey source for a lot of fish um, and even some terrestrial mammals. Um, and then um, as they get larger, there are very few predators that consume that can consume a, a full-sized adult hellbender, um, but they are voracious predators of, of crayfish. Um, <laughs> that's their preferred uh, uh, foraging food. Um, so they absolutely do have an impact um, in in the river ecosystem. Whether you can distinguish that or not, I so it's tough because all of these things are linked, right? So one example and one suspected cause of um, decline for hellbenders is increased sedimentation in a river system that can choke out their eggs. Um, it fills the interstitial spaces that um, the larvae tend to occupy, um, reducing their the habitat availability to that life stage. Um, so, um, but that also has effects to the other animals in that system too, right? So crayfish are also occupying these interstitial spaces. So it is very difficult to tease apart um, what is, you know, specifically the sedimentation versus ah uh, the sedimentation wiped out my prey source or um, you know whatever it might be. So they're all it's all very linked. Um, they're you know right smack in the middle of the food web, and um, so there's cascading effects from all of that. Um, so yeah, very hard to tease that apart. Wonderful. All right. We have now taken more time than we have promised to. So we are done asking you questions. That was fantastic. Thanks so much. I, yeah, this was really exciting. It's really, really excellent to see the work that the zoo is doing in Missouri. And of course, hellbenders, right? I mean, they are the, they're not furry, but they are the charismatic megafauna of the herp world, right? I mean, Absolutely. tons of people want to see these huge, uh, salamanders. I mean, they're, they're awesome. Uh, so anyway, thank you so much, Christina. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>